Good morning and uh, welcome to worship here with Anchor Christian Church. We're glad that you're here gathered for worship, glad that you're watching us online. And I'm turning to Psalm 24 and we're looking at a picture of the golden gate into the temple area in Jerusalem. And this psalm is written about this particular temple. And the psalmist has a problem. He's trying to find someone to lead worship for the temple. And he asks this question. It's kind of like a job description. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. You see, only Jesus is the one who satisfies that criteria of being the one with clean hands and a pure heart. And he leads us in worship, and uh, we rejoice in that together. I invite you to stand together as we sing.
questions about who was worthy to lead worship at the temple. And the, the, the worship scene in heaven in Revelation 5 is also asking, who is worthy to open the scroll? And the elders say, look, the lion is able to open the scroll, the lion who looks like a lamb. And they say, you are worthy to open the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Is anyone worthy? a beautiful idea. He is worthy to hold the whole universe in his hands and control what's happening. When he breaks those seals open, some of them are opened for judgment. And terrible things happen on the earth. You know, we don't appreciate judgment because everything's pretty well been easy for us in our lives. We've never been oppressed. We've never been the downtrodden. But for most of this world, justice matters a huge amount. Are these people going to get away from it or get away with it forever? And the answer is no, they're not. He's worthy to honestly and correctly judge this world. And he's also worthy to save those who put their trust in him. He's worthy to control it all. And so it's a wonderful thing to know that we have hope.
Good morning, Anchor. Thank you for joining us for worship here today in our building. Thank you for those of you who've joined us at home. Thank you for joining your voices and your hearts in praise to God as He deserves. It's encouraging. Let's make sure that we don't just come together here in worship and then go our separate ways completely. Let's make sure we try to stay connected to each other. And, uh, you know, I always talk about this card. It's a simple little tool to help with that. But the idea is that we're, we're together in worship and we continue to remember how to pray for each other. And so this card helps with that because there are places on the back for you to share prayer requests or ways you'd like to be involved or, or other ways. And just saying, I was in worship, I am with this church, is a connection. So uh, please fill out that card if you're here in worship in the room with me today. Drop it in the uh, box in the overflow area, the offering box. If you're watching from home, we've accommodated you with a form uh, right in the, uh, click on show more in the description on the YouTube channel and uh, connect that way, please. Uh, with the online form. If you do uh, stay connected with us through YouTube, then click uh, subscribe and, and the bell button so that you are notified whenever we have put anything out um, or when we're going live, that will remind you that it's time to worship. If you keep track of us through Facebook, click like and follow, and also please click the share button so that others might find us. You would be uh, helping us in reaching out to those that we're hoping to share our worship and our good stuff with by clicking share yourself. Please do that. Now, most of you've heard, but I want to make sure that everybody knows our kids' Sunday school starts up again today here at Anchor right now during this 945 hour. We are doing their Sunday school classes similar to how we've started up junior church. For the time being, two-year-olds will be cared for in the nursery until we're able to start the twos and threes class again. For the time being, preschoolers, that's three and four-year-olds plus kindergartners, are in one class in, uh, in, uh, combined together on the first floor in room 112. First through fifth graders will be in another combined class in the big room upstairs. And also just for now, junior high students combine with the high schoolers into one class in the high school room upstairs until we can break them off into their own separate class again. So I hope that if you have young people in those age groups, you will involve them in Sunday school. I hope that if you've been home worshiping, waiting for that to happen, that you'll come back and worship in person with us like some have today as I look around the room uh, and take advantage of Sunday school. But Sunday school isn't just for kids, right? Howard Klink used to teach one of our adult Sunday school classes, and then Howard had to go and relocate to the Albany area. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. <laughs> but good news, Jeff Fitch has agreed to revive that class for us, and it will start next Sunday, uh, April 18th, and meet in the same room they used to meet in. That's room 211 upstairs in the old wing. So you are invited to that class. We can't start up all of our adult classes right now because of the way we have to use our rooms during this season of social distancing and so on. But we do have that class for you, and if you'd like to take part, come back next Sunday during this hour. Go to room 211, 945, and I'm confident you'll be glad you did. Now, in just a few moments, Lara G. Lombardo is going to come to the podium and give us more information about the Compass Care event that is coming up real soon. So let me just remind you that there are four simple ways to support our missionaries like Compass Care, support our, min our ministries that we support, uh, and the ministries here in our church. You see them on the screen. Uh, you can uh, support our work through clicking on the green Give button on our website, anchorchristian.org. That will take you to our giving app, our online giving app. You can download it to your phone and use it at your convenience that way. You can use the mail, of course, by sending things in the mail. You can use your own bank's online bill pay, like many of you do for other bills. You can do that um, to support your church. Or uh, I, like, I still like to have the feeling of coming before the Lord with an, off with an offering. Uh, and so 
If you're like me, there's an offering box through the center doors in the overflow area if you're here in our church building today. But however you do it, thank you for your generosity toward the Lord's work. And now, Lara, if you would come, here is Lara G., ready to uh, help us learn more about a really great event that we can take part in. Abortion is not just another social issue. Abortion is a symptom of society's fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be human under God. You don't have to just, you know, try to erase something because this isn't a mistake. This is a child. not the right route for me and I don't know if it's really for anybody. We're all made in the image of God and all life is valuable. And that's Compass Care's mission, to erase the need for abortion by transforming a woman's fear into confidence. Together we are forging a more pro-life, pro-family New York. Good morning, Anchor family. I am Lara G. Lombardo. I am your church liaison for Compass Care Missions. So, the walk is on this year, and I'm super excited to be a part of it. And I'm sure that you will too, because we actually get to walk together, next to each other. <laughs> to be human under God, it means so much to us as Christians, but, not why, but why not to others? Hebrews 10 39 says, but we are not of those who shrink back or and are destroyed, but are those who have faith to preserve their souls. That phrase, that scripture, is encrypted in my mind every time I walk through the doors at Compass Care, whether it's to volunteer, to attend a meeting, to represent Anchor Christian Church. God is giving us an opportunity to make a difference right here, right now in New York. This is the abortion capital of the U.S. Last year, well, you know how that went, not good. <laughs> However, the people of God did not stop, either did Compass Care. Despite legislative attacks on pro-life organizations in New York, and despite COVID shutdowns, although abortions were considered essential services, which they never shut down, and either did Compass Care, they did not close their doors, they stayed open. God bless the church's faithfulness, making 2020 Compass Care's most effective, life-saving year ever. Last year, 15% increase in babies were saved, 390. And a 35% increase in women submitting their lives to Jesus, 191. And now, in 2021, it's only April, 92 babies have already been saved and 58 women began following Jesus. So exciting indeed, for sure. So, will you join me and thousands of pro-life Christians across Western New York to serve women, save lives, and walk for life? This year, Compass Care has a new Walk for Life weekend experience, and I'm excited to take part in it with our church. On Friday, April 30th, from seven to eight, We'll have an online walk rally right here in Anchor. We'll join us in the auditorium. We can all gather together, social distancing, but we can get inspired about the walk and encourage others to join us. Then on Saturday, May 1st at 9 a.m., we can join at the Highland Park Bowl and we can walk in person this year. Now, May 1st is my birthday and I'm super excited to celebrate this day so other babies can have birthdays as well. I'm super excited this year, so I hope you can join us. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much, Lara. Appreciate it. Now, John G. Lombardo, her father-in-law, is going to come and have our scripture reading for the day. Good morning, everyone. Before we start, this would be a good time for those here and you watching who have not yet gathered your elements for the Lord's Supper to do so now. We call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic gospels. This just means that they're very much alike. John's gospel kind of reads more like a supplement to the other three. For example, 76% of the material in Mark can be found in both Luke and Matthew, where only 8% of John's gospel is in the other three. Now, many scholars have said that John wrote his gospel years after the other gospels were written. This makes sense since John did have time to write when he was imprisoned in the island of Patmos uh, after 90 AD. Today's scripture is an account very unique to John. That doesn't mean it didn't happen or that it's less important. It's simply that John was making sure that the other episodes of Jesus' ministry that he knew about were also written and distributed. So please stand for the reading of God's word from John chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, John. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we love this story. What a beautiful story about a man born blind, but never, never being able to see his entire life, and then suddenly he can see perfectly. What a beautiful, wonderful work Jesus did. But we know that there's a deeper meaning to it. There was a reason Jesus did this, not just because he loved the man and had compassion on him. He did that but also because he wanted him to really see, and he wanted us to really see as well. You want us to really see. So, Lord, help us. Help us to really see. And I pray that what we do in the next few minutes would be a part of our journey to really seeing. Thank you for Jesus, who opens our eyes as well. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Dr. David Daggerford tells about taking a mission trip to India and visiting a school for blind students. A little girl about six years old was chosen to come forward and place a necklace of flowers around Dr. Daggerford's neck. She groped forward, her eyes seemingly focused in a different direction than where she was going. And as she put the flowers around his neck, Tears began to flow from his eyes because he thought, oh, if I only had the healing touch that Jesus had, if I could only reach out and touch her eyes, I would heal her and, and enable her to see and all these other students here. 
and they would be thrilled. They would get a new lease on life. They would, their parents would be overjoyed. I wish I could do that. Well, John 9 records an incident as G, uh, John G. Lombardo just helped us read when Jesus did just that. He healed a man of physical blindness. Not only that, but he also healed, uh, healed him of spiritual blindness, which we're going to see. And if you put yourself in this man's position, you realize he was really hurting. He had been blind from birth. He had never seen his parents' faces, never seen the love in their eyes. He had never seen the glory of a sunset. He had never seen the blossoms on a tree. He existed by sitting next to the road begging. People assumed that his whole life was identified or, or, or completely bound up with sin. And that's why he was the way he was. That, he, that God had no use for him. He was an outcast of society. He was aching for some meaning in life. Some future. And Jesus brought hope to him. Brought hope to him in time and in eternity. So let's look at his story and the parallels between physical blindness and spiritual blindness, knowing that we all, we all need at least a little bit of a touch of healing from Jesus ourselves. And I hope you'll open your own Bible. I see some of you uh, getting your Bibles out, using your phones. Thank you. John chapter 9, so you can follow along, so you can highlight or make notes and uh, really make this your own. John chapter 9 begins with a spectacular miracle of this blind man healed. Verse 2 says, the disciples asked him, Rabbi, they asked Jesus, Rabbi, was he born blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? That was the only two alternatives that they could conceive of. Either he sinned or his parents sinned because nothing like this happens without sin being involved. The disciples asked the same question that we all wonder about. Why do innocent people suffer? It doesn't make sense to us. Is God punishing his parents or punishing him? Now keep in mind that in that day, it was believed that a little baby could sin even in its mother's womb. And when the baby in the womb was kicking, that was a sign of rebellion. If that was the case, I had several kids who were demon possessed before they were born. But we ask that question kind of like they ask, why do bad things happen to seemingly innocent people. Jesus told the disciples not to blame it on sin and not to blame it on God. Verse 3, it's not because of this man's parents, uh, this man's sin or his parents' sin, but this happened so that God's work could be displayed in his life. This isn't God punishing somebody for their sin, but God is going to use it for a wonderful, uh, glorious uh, display of heaven. There are some questions that will never be fully answered in this world. Jesus didn't say, I came to explain the world, as much as we wish he did. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. He's going to explain it later, maybe, when we have more of a capacity to understand, if we even care about it by then. But Charles Swindoll, I think, was right when he said, God is too kind to be cruel. He's too uh, wise to make a mistake, but he's too deep to fully understand. Jesus said, listen, this man's blindness has nothing to do with his sin, but we can use this terrible tragedy as an opportunity to glorify God in his life, in this man's life, because, and here's the key, because I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light that illuminates everything we need to know about. Then Jesus did a strange thing. He spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes, and then told him, go wash it off. Now, of course, to us, spittle seems unsanitary, definitely not in keeping with CDC guidelines. But in that day, saliva, especially saliva from a holy person, was thought to have healing powers. J 
just in the saliva. So Jesus was a wise physician. He met the man where he was. He won his confidence by doing what the man would have expected uh, a competent doctor of that day to do. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? Wow. This man getting down there, washing his face, not knowing what's going to happen. And then he opens his eyes and he can see. And he is just soaking in everything around him. And I know he must have shouted at the top of his lungs, I can see, I can see. Is that red or green? I don't know, but it's, it's spectacular. I had no idea yellow could be so yellow. You know what? He headed home, but I think he might have had a hard time finding his way. He probably had to stop at an intersection and close his eyes and listen to get his bearings. Oh yeah, this way. Because he'd never, he'd never seen this new world. But the first thing he did was go to tell his parents that he could see again. Or he could see for the first time, actually. And of course, they were overjoyed. But surprisingly, not everybody was overjoyed. Not everybody celebrated this miracle. In fact, some stubbornly denied that a miracle had even happened. Because why? They were spiritually blind. They were spiritually blind. It was a matter of, don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. His neighbors did not want to admit that they'd been wrong about Jesus. Their pride got in the way. And so they rejected the idea that he had healed somebody. Four times in this chapter, people asked, how were you healed? And he kept saying, Jesus opened my eyes. The man named Jesus opened my eyes. So finally, they brought him to the Pharisees. And they asked him, how did you receive your sight? And he gave the same answer. Jesus healed me. They said, no, Jesus is not from God. We know that because he breaks the Sabbath. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. Instead of sharing the joy of this incredible healing, the Pharisees grind their teeth over the fact that a miracle happened on the Sabbath, and they believe that a healer, his work is to heal, so he should not work on the Sabbath, so he shouldn't heal anybody on the Sabbath. That was their reasoning. They were angry because Jesus had broken their custom. And they refused to believe the obvious. So verse 18 says that they sent for the man's parents and they grilled them. Is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he can see? Well, the parents are terrified. Because these aren't just religious leaders. These are the political leaders too. And they had the power to, to do what is called... Um, kick the parents out of the synagogue, kick them out of the synagogue if they answered wrongly. And that didn't just mean they couldn't go to church anymore. It meant they were completely ostracized from the community. They couldn't do business with anybody. They would be completely shunned and ostracized by their neighbors. So they, the parents, evaded the question. They said, well, you know, we weren't there. We really don't know how he was healed. But he's of age. Ask him. You can ask him. So in verse 24... They called the guy back in, and again they asked him, but they said this time, give glory to God, not Jesus, because we know that he's a sinner. So don't even bring Jesus up again. But the man's answer was classic. Verse 25. Whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. I was blind, but now I can see. And you know what? That honest answer made these Pharisees so mad that they immediately excommunicated him. They threw him out of the synagogue. He's right back where he started. He had been completely alone before. He received his sight an hour or two ago. Three hours ago, maybe. I'm finally a part of the community. And now they've pushed him away again. What was wrong with these guys? These really religious guys? This was undeniable evidence of a supernatural event right in front of their eyes, but they rejected it. Well, they were spiritually blind. They were spiritually blind. 
And people do the same thing today. Here's all this evidence of the historical testimony about Jesus and, and creation and our own conscience within and the church's existence and the Bible with the New Testament. The calendars divided into B.C. and A.D. The work of the Holy Spirit. Transformed lives that you can see. But people see all of that and cynically reject it because they have spiritual blindness. It doesn't as we say today, it doesn't fit their narrative. Ross Broadfewer wrote, a man's cataracts may not be in his eyes, but in his mind. So I want to suggest there are at least four kinds of spiritual cataracts that are blinding people today. First, painful circumstances blind some people. Job had ten children who were all killed in one freak accident. His health broke. He lost all his wealth. And Job asked, who can see any hope for me? Some people have so many problems that they have a hard time seeing God at all. And they'll say things like, if there really were a loving God, he wouldn't let my child be born blind. He wouldn't let my mate get cancer. He wouldn't let my house be destroyed by a flood if he really loved us. And they end up so angry at God that they can't see straight. A second kind of cataract that blinds people is habitual sin. 1 John 2.11 reads, Whoever hates his brother walks around in darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. In other words, you can hate somebody so much or you can live such a sinful life that you end up really spiritually blind. Old time miners used to use mules to pull loads down in the mines and the mules would live down there for years and decades and some of those mules who spent all their lives in the dark mines would lose their sight. And we can be those mules. We can live so long in the darkness of this world that when somebody turns on the light of the gospel, it hurts our eyes, and we purposely close our eyes to it. Romans 1.21 talks about people who, I, who it identifies as, as wicked people, and it says that their thinking becomes futile and their hearts become darkened. You've probably got friends, relatives, neighbors, co-workers that make some of the craziest decisions and you wonder why. But it might be because they've lived so long in the darkness, they can't see a clear path that's wise. Their minds are darkened. They don't have the capacity to think it through. Some people are blinded because of intellectual pride. Dr. Doug, Doug Borchman is a Christian. He's a university professor and researcher who specializes in the human eye. And he wrote, the eye is amazingly complex. And to believe that all the intricate parts of the eye could develop by numerous successive slight modifications over even trillions of years, as evolutionary scientists theorize, is absurd. One of the main problems with it is if you don't have all the parts, it won't work. So how do you get all those complex parts through minor modifications over over time. It doesn't make sense. But he goes on. He says, I'm not the only one to draw that conclusion. The complexity of the, of the eye confounded Charles Darwin. And we now know that the eye is infinitely more complex than he could have imagined in 1890. With all this evidence of creation that convicts some scientists, some scientists look at it and say, well, I don't believe in Jesus, but obviously there had to be somebody designing the, all of this. They say there's some intelligent designer somewhere. If they come to that conclusion, why do other scientists reject it? Because of intellectual pride. To believe in Jesus would be too humbling. That's what little children believe, right? That's what simpletons believe. That's what the uneducated believe. This is the age of enlightenment. We don't need the light of heaven. So intellectual pride says, I've got questions. I'm unsettled inside. I need direction. Oh, I know what I'll do. I will look inward. You know, I'm my own answer. And looking inward is a very American thing to do, 
very Western thing to do. It, but it, it's not reliable. Jesus is the truth. I'm not. I can't figure out what I really need to figure out by looking inside my own heart or mind. I need to look in the Bible, God's Word to me, that answers the questions I need answered. And Jesus said, God's Word cannot be broken. Then, religious tradition blinds some people as well. Just like the Pharisees who had their traditions about the Sabbath, there are some people today who have religious customs ingrained in them, and it makes them blind to the real Christ. I remember hearing about a church that had the custom of putting a white tablecloth over the trays on the communion table. The elders would come forward, they would pray at the communion table, then they would very solemnly, formally grasp the corners of that cloth and ceremonially lift it up and fold it and set it aside, and then they would hand the trays to the uh, ushers who would distribute it to the people. When somebody suggested that they not perform that ceremony anymore, the people got really upset. You know, like, you're trying to get rid of the Shroud of Turin off of the Ark of the Covenant or something. And they said, we have to do it that way. That's what makes the Lord's Supper sacred. And to prove their point, they investigated. Why do we do this? But they couldn't figure out why. Nobody knew. Finally, a very old man living in a nursing home heard about the controversy. He said, oh, I can tell you why we do that. Years ago, before air conditioning, we had the windows open. We put a white tablecloth over it so that the flies would stay out of the communion juice. It wasn't anything sacred at all. Isn't it amazing how religious traditions can become gospel truth over a short period of time? And not just by the Pharisees. It has to be that old translation of the Bible to really be God's Word. It has to be those old songs that we used to sing to be sacred. The same order of the worship service. The same terminology. We have to do the same programs. The same surroundings. The same size church. Or it can't possibly be of God because it's not like what we're used to. We slip into blindness. Thankfully, the last part of John 9 reveals a spiritual discovery. This seeing man really began to see. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. I say he's all alone again, but, but Jesus went to him. He wasn't all alone. Having found him, he said... Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Now at this point, the fellow had been physically healed, but he had not been saved spiritually. He had sight, but he did not have insight. He had met Jesus, but he, he had not seen Jesus. All he had done was hear his voice. But Jesus came looking for him. And Jesus said, Well, you've seen him. That's, that's a fun thing. The man never seen anything before that day. You've seen the Son of Man. In fact, it's he who is speaking to you. The man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I see three steps this man took to be healed of both his physical and his spiritual blindness. First, he had an encounter with Jesus. And if you have trouble seeing spiritually, you don't need to study all the world religions and, and investigate everything that, that's being said out there. You really need to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. You need to read about Him in the Bible. You need to come to Him personally. Meet Him personally. He is alive. That's what we celebrate on Easter last Sunday. We really celebrate it every week. But He is alive. You don't just... Learn about Him, you meet Him, you know Him. He says, you'll seek Me, and you will find Me when you search for Me with all your heart. All your heart. So an encounter with Jesus. Second, the second step He took was, He obeyed Christ's command, even though He didn't understand why. 
go wash your eyes. What good would that do? I've washed my face a million times. He didn't know, but he went. He did what Jesus told him to do, and then he could see. If you want to spiritually see, obey Christ's commands, whether or not you understand all the reasons why he's given those commands. When you obey, then you'll start to understand. In John chapter 8, Jesus said it in a different way. If you hold to my teaching, not just know my teaching, not just go to Sunday school and learn my teaching, or even memorize my teaching, but if you obey it, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We don't know the truth just by reading it. We know the truth by doing it. That's when we're set free. But sometimes people say, well, I'll follow Christ when I understand it all, but I want to put it all together first. My friend, if you wait until you understand it all, you'll never respond. It's like carrying a lantern down a dark path. You don't see the end of the path. You only see a few feet in front of you. But you go forward the little bit that you can see, and then you can see more. That's why the Bible is called a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. So Jesus tells you to be baptized. Why? Well, when you do it, you see. Jesus tells you to pray. Why? When you do it, in the course of time, you see why. He commands you to be generous and give. Why? You do it. He blesses you. You see why. Then the third thing this man did, he remained mentally tough. Isn't it interesting that as soon as he was healed, he began to have problems? He knew how to live as a blind man. He'd get along okay. Not great, but he could get along okay as a blind man. Now suddenly he, he's able to see and everything falls apart. His neighbors question him and don't believe him, what he's telling them. The Pharisees kicked him out of the, the synagogue. Uh, the Pharisees roughed up his parents. But he still held on to his belief in Christ. He said, I'm not going to go back because this one thing I know, I was blind and now I can see. When you allow Jesus Christ to change you, that is no guarantee that your life is going to go smoothly from then on. In fact, sometimes it gets harder. But once you see the light, you never want to go back and live in darkness again. John Newton was a wicked man. He prided himself on being a free thinker, living a wild, out-of-control life. He loved to pull other people down into sin with him. He was a slave trader and proud of it. He was so blasphemous that one sea captain said, I don't want John Newton on my ship because God's going to call down a curse on him. But one day, John Newton finally admitted how miserable he was and he quit running from God. And he wrote that poem to express how he felt about the Lord. That poem that we love to sing, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's what this man said. I was blind, now I see. One thing I know, that that's the, what's, what happened to me. So Lord, I believe. And Jesus said, in response, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Let's make sure we're on the right side of that. Dr. David Daggerford's heart went out to this young blind Indian girl putting flowers around his neck and he thought how wonderful it would be to be able to take away her blindness like Jesus could. But then he said it hit me. We can help them see spiritual truth. And in the end, that's better. Because if they are touched with the gospel 
and come to know Jesus Christ, they will see one day for eternity. They will see. And yet there are so many people who have 20-20 vision on this earth who one day are going to be cast out in the outer darkness and never be able to see again because they do not spiritually see now. They refuse. Jesus Christ is here to touch your spiritual eyes and make you see so that you can walk out of the darkness of this world and into the light of your heavenly Father. And then one day, He will wipe away all tears from your eyes forever. In fact, the Bible says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor has the mind of man conceived what God prepared for those who love Him. So I guess my final question today is, do you love Him? I'm not asking, do you believe He exists? Do you believe Jesus once walked this earth? Or even that He died on the cross? But do you love Him? Do you serve Him? Is He your King? Is He your, is he your Lord and Master? Is He your Savior? Have you given yourself over to Him? And please, let us know how we can help you take the next steps to, to get there, to make that happen. Let us show you in the Bible what it says about a, how a person makes Jesus your king. Say something to me at the doors over there as I greet people. Mark on your green card that I had you fill out earlier in the bottom right-hand part where it says, I want more information about becoming a Christian or becoming a member of this church. If you're watching from home, use the white form on the second page, the online form. Uh, there's a spot for you to check a box that says, I want to know more about becoming a Christian so that we can get you the information you need so that you can begin to love him, serve him, and honor him as he deserves. It would be our honor to help you with that. Okay, we've started a new series now today. A series called Strength for the Journey. And I'm praying that when we're done with this month of, ser of sermons that you'll feel stronger. You'll know that you're equipped uh, just a little bit better so that you can... Uh, make it through the challenging days ahead. That's where we're headed, okay? Right now, we're headed into communion. Jerry?
Another quick note, the communion juice pack you picked up earlier has a couple of layers. The first opens the bread part and the second the juice part. Sometimes they're tough to peel back so you may want to <clears throat> open the top part in advance. Last week at Easter, I got the chance to share a brunch with the people that mean the most to me. There was enough food for seconds and thirds, not that I overindulged. But the food was good, as was the company and the conversation. Sharing food and fellowship is a good thing, and I believe honored by the good Lord of the universe. As good as things were for our little group this past Easter Sunday, though, Jesus offers even more. The intimate scene in Matthew of uh, Jesus and his special people that were reclining at the dinner table is a very strong witness to the importance of sharing fellowship with Christ and with each other. Yes, sharing ourselves and our time with people we know well seems as easy as falling over that proverbial log. Opening our homes, though, and sharing a meal with people we may know less than family adds even more depth to our relationship with them. But it does take more energy and risk to get to this level. But it still appears doable. On the risk scale, sharing dinner with a head of state might feel incredibly awkward. But as long as we mind our manners, use a napkin instead of our sleeves, and avoid controversial topics, and keep from asking for autographs, we should be OK. But how do we do fellowship with God, Father God or Jesus? We can't see them. And we must be, go beyond watching our manners. We now need to watch our thoughts. This all seems impossible. Why would the Father or Jesus want a fellowship with us when they know us better than we know ourselves? I think it's called unconditional love. Even though Jesus doesn't enjoy false speech when he knows our hearts, he still wants to be near us. He thinks so much of us that just nine days ago we recounted his death, which provided not only forgiveness for sin, but also a path to heaven. Jesus also wants to be close so he can unburden us of the sin that wears us down, makes us feel unworthy, and even worse, keeps us at arm's length from him due to that feeling of embarrassment and unworthiness that we have. Last, we are his creation, and he wants us to protect he wants to protect us from the devil because the devil relentlessly accuses and advocates against us before God. So how do we fellowship with Jesus? We can start by being prayerfully honest with God. A good way is to examine our conscience before we participate in the Lord's Supper and seek his guidance and forgiveness. Next, we need to accept that scripture calls us to fellowship with God. Isaiah 55, one through three says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you will have food without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Come to me. Listen, that you may live. And last, don't be afraid to respond to the Lord, since he has our best interests in mind. Note the word come that occurred at least a half a dozen times in that passage of Isaiah that I uh, just read. Well, that appeared that many times for a good reason. And also the term do not fear or do not be afraid, appears in scripture 365 times, once for every day. That's also no accident, like the 
fantasticness of the eye that uh, Chris was talking about, about what that optical surgeon talked about. None of this speaks of a God who's uncaring about his people or unconcerned, rather of someone who would die for us. In Revelations 3.20, Jesus said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Jesus will meet us anywhere, anytime, just the way we are because he loves us and he wants to be with us. He said in Matthew 28, 20, behold, I am with you to the end of the age. And James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. These verses seem pretty comforting to me and I hope to all of you. So let's pause for some personal reflection before we take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus. Without him, we are lost. Thank you also that we live in a country where we still can acknowledge you outwardly. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the bread which represents Jesus' body broken for us. And this is a juice which represents Jesus' blood shed for our salvation. We do this in memory of him. I was reading in Leviticus 14. I am thankful for boring portions of the Bible. Because in those portions, I sometimes find gems. And this one gem I found in Leviticus 14 is worth sharing. When a person is healed of leprosy, they are to get two pigeons and go show themselves to the priest one of the birds is involved in ritualistic sacrifice, and the other one, they go to the edge of town and set it free. 
And what a beautiful picture of the person who is free from leprosy being set free from that leprosy. And uh, when Jesus cleanses us, he makes us free.